RPE stands for Rate of Perceived Exertion. Mike Tuchere describes it as an evaluation of performance. RPE training uses a numerical scale of 1 through 10, 1 being the easiest, 10 being maximum. Really, the scale is just 6 through 10. Anything below RPE 6 represents an effort that would be considered a light warm-up, and at that point, you're better off just using percentages. For example, do 5 reps with 50%. RPE is a useful way to gauge intensity, which refers to a percentage of your 1 rep max. But unlike set in stone, percentage-based programs, RPE training is flexible. Rather than pairing a set number of reps with a percentage, for example, 5 reps with 70% of your 1 rep max, you would pair a set number of reps with a number on the RPE scale. For example, 5 reps at RPE 8. That's not to say that RPE 8 is always 70%, it's just an example. RPE 10 is a true max. You could not do one more rep. RPE 9 means you could do one more rep. RPE 8 means you could do two more reps. RPE 7 means <clears throat> RPE 7 means you could do three more reps. RPE applies to any number of reps. For example, if you did 300 pounds for one rep and you think you could only do one more rep, that would be an RPE 9. If you did 300 pounds for 10 reps and you could only do one more rep, that would still be RPE 9. In my opinion, RPE is the most useful method of tracking effort. It can be just as important as tracking weight on the bar and number of reps. It ensures you are working with the correct intensity for each given workout on any day at any time. It accounts for training fatigue from day to day and week to week, and even within a single session. Percentage-based training can be highly flawed because you are basing your training weight off of a one rep max that you set how long ago? Two, three, four or more months ago? After a stressful month of training, you are probably not peaked like you were when you set that one rep max months ago. And what about fatigue within a training session? If you're performing competition squat for six sets of five reps, and then competition bench press for another six sets of five reps, by the time you get to your pause deadlifts, they're going to be a lot tougher than they would be if you were to perform them when you were fresh. And that 70% work feels more like 80%. But an RP8 is always an RP8 because it lets us know at exactly what intensity these pause deadlifts should be at. Percentage-based programs also make weight selection for assistance exercises very difficult. Most of us don't know our close grip bench max or our beltless pause squat max, so to prescribe a set percentage off of your competition lift is not optimal and it can be highly inaccurate. Close grip bench press with 75% of your competition bench is going to produce different results in terms of difficulty for two different people. Some people can pause squat a weight that is fairly close to their competition squat. Some people don't come nearly as close. But an RP8 is the same dosage of intensity for any two people. As a power lifter, handling circa max singles leading up to a meet should be included in your training. It's a skill that needs to be practiced. And exposure to heavy singles will make you better at handling heavy singles. Performing singles at a given RPE allows you to track your progress, kind of like a check-in. You can see which singles are trending up. It can also be used to establish an estimated one rep max for that particular day, and subsequent sets can be based off of that single. I suppose you could include percentage-based singles into your program, but I still think that performing singles using the RPE scale is a much better option. During my last training cycle, I had several PRs during training. This was before my meet. And this would likely not happen on a percentage-based program because I've yet to come across a program that prescribes 105% of your max today. And while many people initially think that RPE-based training only accounts for bad days, meaning I'm not feeling that good today, I'm gonna take it easy, that's not the case. It can also swing the other way, taking advantage of good days, just like I explained with my successful PRs during my last training cycle. After using RPE-based training for about a year now, and with the guidance of my coach, Austin Baraki, I have learned that RPE is not this emotional cop-out excuse to take it easy in the gym. Tell me how that set made you feel. In here, Mr. Thrall. 
Can I, can I call you Alan? Again, like Mike Teixeira says, it's an evaluation of your performance. Based on that rep or that particular set, how many more reps could you have done? Not how many more reps do you wish you could do, how many more reps do you want to be able to do, and not was that hard or was that easy. If I'm performing five reps at RP9, it's going to be hard. If I'm doing a single with 525 pounds on my back, it's going to feel heavy, but that's okay because it's supposed to. RPE training allows you to reflect on your performance. And lastly, RPE training is not completely subjective like a lot of people assume it is. I don't walk into the gym wondering if my single at eight will be 400, 500, maybe 600. I already know what my single at RPE eight is, so I should be right around that for the day. I do not get under an empty barbell, squat a few reps and say, eh, it kind of feels like crap today. I think I'm gonna call my single at eight at this number. That's not RPE, you're doing it wrong. A great program that's poorly executed does not work. I'll admit, RPE training is not perfect because there's really no way of finding out whether you actually had two reps or three reps left in the tank, but that's okay, just do your best. Use your best judgment. But percentage-based training is not perfect either for the reasons I mentioned in this video. And I'm not trying to make the argument that percentage-based training doesn't work. I actually use percentages in my own program, but it's usually alongside RPE. For example, on the squat, I might have to work up to a single at RP8, and I end up squatting 500. Then I would subtract 22% off the bar and do five sets of five with it. That would give me 390. So this percentage-based training is highly specific or accurate, I should say, because it's based off of this top single that I did on this particular day, not on a single that I did four months ago. Now, RPE is not for everyone. If you're a lazy person who's like a cancer in the gym, you are probably better off following a percentage-based program. Dang, man, I'm just not feeling it today. Ugh, my back is kind of tight today. Bro, do your ankles ever get stiff? Ugh. I think I slept on my shoulder wrong. Bro, you ever get tired like in the middle of the day? I get hella tired. Hey, you guys wanna get out of here and get some Chipotle? Sick. Hey bro, you spot me on cash? Sweet, I'll pay you back. This type of person probably needs to shut up and just be told what to do. Again, a great program will still not work well if you are a lazy person. On the other side of that, if you tend to be a bit overconfident, Dang. call it 7.5. You might be a little too reckless with RPE training. And lastly, if you're a novice, you don't need to worry about RPE training. I always suggest following linear progression and just adding five pounds each session for as long as you can until that stops working. But that doesn't mean you can't start learning RPE. I have my clients who are on linear progression rate each set of five reps using the RPE scale. After the first set, I'll ask them, how many more do you think you could have done? What would you rate that? This gives them time to practice judging RPE. And finally, wrapping up, you're probably thinking to yourself, this is all great information, but what the heck am I supposed to do with it? Well, I would suggest heading over to the Barbell Medicine website and downloading the free ebook and program called The Bridge. Please read the short ebook before starting the program. In the second part of this RPE video, I'll discuss the minor details of using RPE, like how do I determine what weight to use? Spoiler alert, there's a percentage chart on the RTS website and in the Bridge ebook that you can follow at first. And questions like what happens if I misjudge RPE? And some common mistakes that I often see. FYI, all of those questions are actually answered in the Bridge ebook, but you still probably won't read it. That's it, thanks for watching part one of RPE Explained. Until next time, always remember, Tread on time! <laughs>